Right. Okay, today we're uh, going to talk more about the, uh, plant, the rocky planets, and we're going to talk about their atmospheres, most of all. Uh, one question is, uh, how does the Earth has uh, interesting weather, uh, including these hurricanes? Uh, why, why do hurricanes move from, west, from east to west? All right, and uh, east to west, yeah. All right, how's all this work? All right, so let's, uh, let's go on. Okay, we, uh, we want to talk a little bit more about Venus. I was too, too hurried on uh, Tuesday. All right, so uh, why, here's the question, why Venus has such a strong greenhouse? You see, this, uh, my uh, laser pointer is now bright enough to see. I'm, I cannot see them when they're faint and if it's red. So this green laser pointer is essential for me. Um, all right, so uh, how come Venus has such a strong greenhouse? How come? Now, Earth and Venus are so similar. And they have similar amounts of carbon dioxide. They really do. Why does Venus have all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and Earth has very little in the atmosphere, incredibly little? What happened to all our carbon dioxide? Uh, and the answer is that, as I tried to say last time, uh, sedimentary rocks, dolomite, limestone, they contain 40 times our atmosphere, 40 times the total of our atmosphere. And since carbon dioxide is only less than 1% of our atmosphere, it contains uh, 10 to the fourth times our atmosphere is carbon dioxide. All of our carbon dioxide is in sedimentary rocks. How come it's in sedimentary rocks? Uh, it, we think uh, primitive Earth, CO2 is in the atmosphere, and it dissolved in the oceans and then precipitated to form these, uh, this, this rock, uh, form uh, sediments, and then they get compressed, they get pulled under with our tectonic system, it pulls them under and they become uh, rocks. I mean, when they're squeezed so hard, uh, and the calcium uh, precipitation is uh, either seashells or just raw precipitation. Either one will work. All right. Uh, so what happened is the greenhouse gases were pulled out of the atmosphere, and uh, that cooled down the atmosphere. So the sun can be very, very cold, and yet the earth will still be warm because we have a very thick blanket on. And when the Earth warms up, our blanket, uh, we took off more layers of the blanket. Venus never did. And we warmed up. So they were synchronized. One goes down while the sun goes up. Very convenient for keeping the water on the Earth cold, keeping it uh, in the ocean. All right, so that is, uh, that is why the oceans never evaporated. Never, I'm sorry, the oceans were always present why the earth was, didn't freeze like a snowball in the early days, because uh, they had so much, so much heat from wearing a blanket and keeping you very warm. OK, Venus has no oceans and probably never did have oceans. Venus is warmer than the earth. And uh, so that might have something to do with it. Uh, and we say Venus has a runaway greenhouse. What do we mean? Uh, and so here, CO2 never dissolves in an ocean. As the sun warms up, the hot surface eventually will evaporate the entire ocean. The CO2 is wearing a very thick blanket, and you get warm underneath as the sun increases. And then eventually, uh, surface temperature is high and just evaporates the whole thing. Remember, now the temperature of Venus is 700 some degrees Kelvin. That's plenty to evaporate water, so the water isn't there, uh, isn't in an ocean form, and it probably was never in an ocean form. Uh, all right, so the greenhouse of all, the water is, remember, water vapor is itself a good greenhouse. If you put enough water vapor into the atmosphere, it makes a hell of a greenhouse on you. So uh, you take it off the ocean, put it in the atmosphere, it's like putting a down jacket on top of your down jacket. And the temperature goes from 700 degrees to 1,600 degrees. 
And what that'll do to the water is it'll push it up. It gets really hot. The water vapor is high in the atmosphere. And there, the uh, ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun can break the water vapor, the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And then the hydrogen atoms can fly away. Once that happens, it's gone. If you haven't got the hydrogen atoms, you don't have water. And so the water is dissipated uh, by this process, and uh, the water is never seen again. The oxygen will combine with uh, some other stuff. It's very reactive. It'll make sulfuric acid or something. OK. Uh, so uh, UV breaks the radiation, I mean, breaks the water apart. And the uh, oxygen reacts with something, water goes away, the, the hydrogen goes away, and that's it. Bye-bye, water. OK, now, what lesson do we have for Earth from this? Uh, the greenhouse effect on the Earth uh, will strengthen as the, as the Earth is warmed, uh, as the water is added. Uh, all the primordial CO2 is going to stay there, fortunately. It won't affect the limestone and dolomite, uh, so no danger there. But the CO2 can increase and increase. OK. Uh, runaway greenhouse evaporation is not going to happen on Earth. It will happen on Earth when the, Earth, when the sun runs out of energy and becomes something called a red giant. Uh, and that will. Uh, then the sun's luminosity increases a factor of 1,000. Uh, when the luminosity increases a big amount like that, uh, it cooks the Earth. You know, I think we better, be, better leave by that time. OK, but that's 4 billion years into the future. So you know, we have lots of time to worry about it. <laughs> OK. Uh, all right, now Venus or Mars. Uh, a couple things on Mars. It's the fourth. It's uh, the fourth planet after uh, after the three interior: uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then comes uh, Mars. One and a half AU from the Sun. Uh, that makes its uh, year uh, 687 Earth days to go around the Earth or around the Sun slowly. Uh, radius is is a small planet. It's Small, about half the Earth radius. Mean density is less than, way less than, uh, than the Earth. Remember, the Earth's density is about five and a half grams per cubic centimeter. This is about half that, or a little less, a little more than half. The mass is very light. Uh, it's only 10%, uh, 11% of the Earth. And it has two moons. Uh, these moons are probably captured asteroids from the past. They're shaped like potatoes. They don't look like a planet. They're not round. Why aren't they round? Why are, the Why are most of the things round and these things shaped like potatoes? Anybody? I'm sorry? Uh, who said that? Large? The gravity of Mars or the gravity of Phobos in Deimos? Huh? All right, anybody else? That's right. That's the right answer. The mass of the, of the asteroids, or these planets, these little moons, is not large enough for the moon to squeeze itself and have pressure to make it round. Uh, because that's, that's the minimum energy state if it goes into a round state. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with Mars, OK? Uh, so the, it's la it was round when it's big enough. All the planets around the sun are round, pretty round. OK, uh, Martian day is pretty much like that of the Earth, uh, just a little more. Uh, spin axis is 24 degrees. What's our spin axis? Anybody? Huh? 23 and a half degrees. And that is what gives us our climate. You know, spinning like this, and the sun's there. We spin around. And so the sun's either high or low, giving us our climate, summer and winter. 
All right, so Mars has similar climates. It's got spin axis is inclined. Mars has seasons for the same reason we do. Okay, uh, here are some pictures of Mars. Uh, Olympus Mons, a super grand, grand Canyon. Remember, this is 200 kilometers here. This is, uh, I can't remember what, this is 200 kilometers there. Here is the, uh, the uh, uh, satellite that carried uh, the uh, latest uh, moving satellites, uh, the moving robots. Uh, what are they called? Uh, Mars, Mars Rover and, yeah, they're Mars Rovers. What names do they have? Uh, anybody? Eric? Spirit and Opportunity, okay. Spirit and Opportunity. Here's the tracks of Spirit or Opportunity leaving uh, the, the, uh, the mothership. Uh, you can see these parallel tracks. All right, here are pictures of, uh, from above, satellite that orbits. Uh, you can see these channels, water channels. That's clearly water runoff. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, there's nothing else that's going to make this sort of track. Uh, we know what that is. Now, why does Mars have such water channels when there's no evidence of water at all? None that, you can, that you're really convinced of. There is some, but we'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, now, these stream beds are probably extremely old. Uh, they're not like a stream bed on, in, the, in the Earth that gets covered up by wind and erosion within a few hundred years, these stream beds will last billions of years. There's really nothing to erase them. Uh, it has a very thin atmosphere. So uh, the ancient evidence is there. Uh, here's a stream bed. Here's another cut across a crater. Uh, which way is this water flowing? It's flowing this way because this is a stream bed of mer I think it's flowing that way. Anyhow. Uh, if there's still life on Mars, it's probably underground or extinct. It had flowing water, uh, and maybe life developed at that time, at least water-based life, maybe. Uh, 20 years ago, or 20 years in the future, we might find evidence for fossil life, maybe. Uh, or maybe we won't. All right? So, geology. Uh, magnetic field is zero. Per, not zero, but small. And that means that the core of Mars is solidified. If the core of Mars is solidified, there's nothing driving a tectonic system, and so its tectonics are frozen. The Earth depends on those tectonic, on, depends on the molten core for the, the uh, convective, convective cycle above it. After all, the molten, molten core is giving a lot of heat to the mantle above it and causing it to flow. So there's no, earth, there's no earthquakes, nothing. It's very stable. Okay. Uh, uh, and Mars has a gigantic uh, volcano, that Olympus Mons, 700 kilometers uh, and 25 uh, kilometers high. That's a gigantic. Remember, Mars is a small planet. And yet, it's, it's huge compared to Mauna Loa, which is the largest volcano on the Earth. Mauna Loa, 120 kilometers across, nine kilometers above the Pacific floor. All right, so why, why do you think, uh, what forces are there that prevent the Earth from uh, having Mauna Loa larger? Why isn't Mauna Loa larger, something competitive with uh, Mars? How does Mars get such a tall <coughs> volcano? Yeah. That's fair enough, and that would make Mars Mauna Loa much bigger. But there's something else that was that sort of squashes it down. Uh, if yeah, the oceans. Well, it's it's uh, it's above the ocean. Uh, counting the ocean depth underneath it uh, makes a few more kilometers uh, to its height, but it still doesn't compete with, uh, with uh, Olympus Mons. Yes? Is it because the mass of the Earth is, is bigger, so it has a stronger gravitational pull, making it like, not as tall, kind of 
like how uh, Martin's two moons were uh, like kind of potato shaped or whatever? Uh, that's it. That's it. The gravitational pull of the Earth is strong enough that it's pretty hard to make a, to have uh, the lava climb up higher than it is. If it goes up higher, gravity is constantly rip, trying to rip the thing down, and this is a balance between the pushing up of uh, the Earth and the pulling down of the gravity around it. And so they keep it in equilibrium. There's not the same equilibrium in Mars. It's there, but it's pretty weak. Uh, and uh, uh, so that allows the volcanoes to get very large. Uh, all right. The Mariner Valley, is that the long canyon on Mars? 4,000, it's actually amazing. 4,000 kilometers in length, 120 kilometers wide, seven kilometers deep. You know how deep that is? How deep is the Grand Canyon? It's about, anybody? How deep is the Grand Canyon in kilometers? Two or three. And it's not 120 kilometers wide. It's a small fraction of that. It's tiny. And it's not 4,000 kilometers long. It's like 50 kilometers long. So the Grand Canyon would fit into the corner of, of uh, Mariner Valley. What the hell is, is this small planet doing with such a huge canyon? Why is it there? Uh, all right. This, uh, these features related to cooling of Mars. It probably didn't have plat tectonics. Uh, and uh, as the planet shrinks, as the planet cools off, it tends to shrink. Uh, you know, everything shrinks when it's cooler. It shrinks and uh, it cracked and gave the Mariner Valley at the time it, it cooled down. So uh, if the Earth would cool down, we would get some big cracks on it too. But uh, it's warm and so it doesn't form them. But the Mariner Valley is almost certainly uh, due to the cooling planet. Okay. Uh, mission to Mars, if you want to see about it, you can see this Mars rover, JPL, NASA, Gov. Take a look at that and see the adventures of uh, two, uh, the two rovers. Uh, here's a picture taken, like, uh, taken from uh, one of the rovers. Um, and it's featuring these things called uh, hematite blueberries. I have not seen those, but uh, they're... they're large amount of iron in a, in a ball-shaped feature. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, but it, this is Mars, and this is Utah. You can get them mixed up, you know? You can't tell one from the other. Utah's very dry, and Mars is very dry. Uh, so this is a, this is a impact crater, uh, slammed down, big impact crater, and uh, I think it's opportunity Took the, uh, they guided it to go down the impact crater. They want to see what's inside this deep on the surface of Mars. Okay, so I think it's still there. All right. Uh, all right, here is, let's see. Yeah. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, these are views from, um, let's see if I can make this thing work. Uh, okay, watch this down at the bottom. What are they? Tornadoes are smaller than tornadoes, dust devils, they're called. Ever heard the term dust devils? Okay, uh, a dust devil on Mars. Uh, and this, uh, this is on the plane of Mars, a uh, pretty neat picture. Uh, so that, uh, this is what you see from, um, from these two uh, rovers. Looks boring, looks flat, dead, and that's what Mars looks like. Okay, uh, here's what Mars looked like uh, when you look at it closely. Uh, first, uh, it, you see this rock. And then they blow up this region here. You see this, this region here. 
Uh, then you blow it up again, and you see it very tightly blown up. Uh, these grooves in it, this little ball. And these grooves are something, uh, uh, this is, they say, the, the geologists tell me, or tell people, that these are formed in water. This is, they say this is proof that uh, Mars had water on it at some point. All right, so uh, that's one proof. I don't know how it works, but that's what they say. Okay, here's a rock from Mars. Here's a rock from Mars with a man holding it. He's measuring something. Uh, how the hell did this rock get there? And where is he? Well, he turns out he's in Antarctica. All right, and he's walking on the surface of Antarctica, and he's looking for rocks like this. Now, Antarctica has ice that is kilometers deep. There's no rocks on that ice, or no rocks that belong there. It's not from carving off uh, anything nearby. This is just by itself. How the hell did it get there? Anybody? What's this doing there? How did it get there? This is a piece of Mars, this rock. Huh? Uh, they know it's from Mars. That's a good question. How do they know it's from Mars? Uh, they do chemical composition of the rock and see that the chemical composition is very consistent with that of Mars. It's not consistent with the Earth. Uh, so uh, they learn that way. It's not consistent with the meteorite. And so on that basis, uh, they're pretty sure it's from Mars. So what happened here, this is a, what happened is uh, Mars was struck by a uh, asteroid, uh, asteroid from space. The asteroid hit Mars and blew up, I mean, made a big mess uh, and threw off a lot of rocks. Some of the uh, a rock or several rocks uh, orbited from Mars, from uh, from Mars, and kicked out in space. One of them found its way to Earth, at least this one. This is it's just a crash on Mars, hit the thing hard enough, and something will fly off. That's how it does it. So this it will eject rocks from Mars, pretty neat. But that's a Mars rock, uh, believe it or not. Okay. The Martian atmosphere, it's very thin, only 150th of uh, the Earth is extremely cold uh, and dry. And the atmosphere is made of mostly carbon dioxide. There's no water, very little water vapor, nothing. Okay, uh, daytime temperatures uh, aren't that bad. It's uh, below freezing, a warm jacket will keep you warm. Of course, I don't know what you're going to breathe. You better have a breathing pack with you. Uh, you know, it's not, the, the, being up here is like being way, I mean, you're in space. Uh, you, can't, you can't survive on that amount of uh, atmosphere. Okay. Uh, uh, now, Mars has no atmospheric blanket, and that means uh, when the sun's not on it, it will cool off a lot. And it cools as much as 100 degrees Kelvin. Uh, that is a tremendous amount of water, a tremendous amount. That's, uh, that's like going from boiling to freezing overnight. Uh, okay, and so uh, it, only this time it's going from freezing to really freezing. Uh, all right, so uh, it's, a good thing they, well, it's a good thing the Earth has this atmosphere. Okay, now, what happened to Mars because it used to have an atmosphere? What happened? All right, so uh, we think that the atmosphere on Mars, like the other planets, came from the mass of in, its in interior. It flowed out. Uh, okay. Uh, the uh, carbon dioxide probably was locked into uh, rocks early on and uh, locking away the CO2 forever. Uh, volcanoes spew out fresh CO2, but uh, there isn't any, uh, there isn't any, the greenhouse effect doesn't work. Uh, Mars probably dried up two billion years ago or so, maybe more. All right, now, uh, 
And now the atmosphere is so thin that UV radiation comes down from, our, from the sun and it has energy to split the water, water molecules and it uh, splits them and the, and the hydrogen flies away. Flies away and then the water is gone. And so uh, that's, it's very important for us to have, uh, the ox to have the ozone layer up above us which blocks the ultraviolet from moving to the surface of the earth because it is very dangerous. Okay, now, <clears throat> Furthermore, it has no ma magnetic field, and uh, that means that uh, cosmic rays come in straight at you, and break. they're even another mechanism for breaking you, giving you cancer, uh, and uh, we, that might make it drift away as well. Okay, so, question is, this is something you learned in uh, elementary school, uh, you've got some land over here, and um, you've got a tree, okay, the, how does the carbon cycle work? Well, you all learned about the carbon cycle, uh, sunlight comes down. It makes the CO2 uh, plus uh, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere incorporates into the tree, goes to the tree. Then the tree dies. The tree is dead. Here it is. It's on its side. It decays, and the CO2 goes back out of the atmosphere. Okay? And the cycle time is the t lifetime of a tree. 50 years, 100 years. And that time, uh, carbon, the carbon cycles through the atmosphere. That's the carbon cycle you learned about. Here's another carbon cycle. Uh, you have carbon, it comes in, and uh, it forms limestone. So it's locked away, okay? It's locked in these rocks. Then the limestone, as part of continental drift, it's on a plate that moves, and uh, here is a uh, here is a uh, here is North America. The whole mo the whole plate moves this way, and the plate, uh, the carbon carbon dioxide is on a layer that gets pushed underground as the plates collide. Uh, there's a big collision here, and the net effect is the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide in the limestone layer gets pushed underground. Then it gets hot, the limestone will not survive at high pressure, and it breaks up into carbon dioxide. The limestone is, goes away, carbon dioxide exists, and then it forms volcanoes. And the volcano brings the carbon dioxide out. So it, carbon dioxide works its way up from the melting plate and goes up into uh, the, uh, goes up to the atmosphere, and that's it. Now, on the west coast of the United States, let me draw the west coast. Uh, here's Canada. Uh, 
okay? Uh, there are there's a series of volcanoes here. Now, where, where are the volcanoes? Well, you know the plates are colliding. This plate is colliding with uh, the ocean plate. The volcanoes are not on the coast. There's a volcano inland, 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 inland. Mount Saint, uh, Mount Saint, uh, Mount Shasta is inland, inland. And there's some more down here. All the volcanoes are inland. They're not on the coast. The, we think, you know, you say the earthquake is going to occur on the coast. Why, why are the volcanoes inland? Well, they're inland because it isn't the point where the, where the earthquake happens, say it happens here. The plate has to get pushed down. When it gets pushed down, it reaches at this point, say 50 miles from the ocean, or 100 miles, I don't remember what it is, uh, it reaches a, a depth such that it'll melt. And then you have the carbon dioxide released. Here it goes in, and here it comes out. And this cycle is 50 million years. About that. This is a reasonable time. 50 million years. Okay. Whereas uh, compared to, uh, to the carbon cycle you learned about in school, you learned about this, didn't you? All right. 50, that was 100 years, 50 years. So this is a mere million times slower, but it uh, is effective. All right. So this carbon cycle is very important for keeping uh, the Earth in balance. If, uh, if, it, if it didn't exist, uh, we'd have problems because the carbon dioxide is continuously uh, raining out uh, into the oceans. And we don't like it all to be gone. Okay, so, uh, all right, now let's talk about uh, the Goldilocks theory. Uh, if the, imagine the Earth's distance were further out, than uh, one astronomical unit. Uh, you just define it a little bigger. Uh, that, uh, okay, we want to see what, what area we can have. Uh, we know that Venus is too hot, Mercury, Mars is too cold, and so we're just right in between them. We have liquid water, and we're not sure how far, we, how far the Earth could be moved or Imagine the Earth being moved and still have liquid water through the history of the Earth. But, you know, the Earth is good. So um, that's probably what we want to look for. Uh, and so you want to ask the question, how often does this happen? Now, this is important because uh, you, you want to know because uh, if you're looking at something, you see something there, you can say, well, this has liquid water, then it probably has life. Life that we could possibly detect. All right? How would you detect life? Looking so hard at a planet so far away, how can you detect life on a planet? Anybody? How would you detect life? And this is a hard question. So if you don't know, that's fine. What about oxygen? Oxygen was made by life. It was made by uh, green bacteria, or the cyanobacteria, uh, algae, all kinds of primitive animals and plants. But it's life. And the oxygen in the atmosphere can be detected. And so uh, for us to detect life on another planet would be kind of neat. It uh, would be fun to do that. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but maybe uh, in your lifetime it'll happen. I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. Okay, so now let's turn our, turn our attention to the question of atmospheres. Uh, what is the atmosphere? Uh, a thin layer of gas around the outside of the planet. It's called an atmosphere. 
uh, and it's usually very thin. It has pressure. The pressure is the uh, collisions, molecular and atomic collisions of atoms in the or molecules in the atmosphere. This is something, of course, we didn't know this, right? This is not something uh, the ancients knew about. They didn't know how, what the hell the Earth even had pressure. They didn't, didn't understand this. But we have a pressure we know. Uh, this, an example is uh, you take a balloon, you heat gas in that balloon, uh, and the balloon expands. All right. Uh, the number of collisions will increase. Uh, and we measure pressure in terms of units called a bar. One bar is, one at, is, one, is the pressure of the Earth uh, at sea level. So you can read off pressure on your pressure gauges. Uh, the pressure gauges tell you what uh, the pressure is uh, in terms of uh, centimeters of mercury. Uh, these atmospheric gauges uh, are uh, measured you can measure it in bar. Uh, so the Earth's pressure varies uh, depending exactly what the weather is doing, but more or less the average is that. Okay. Now, uh, the pressure, it turns out, has to balance the gravity. Uh, the atoms want pushing up, the gravity is pulling down, and they have to be in equilibrium. So that's important. Okay. Uh, we have... Uh, for Mercury, uh, Mars, I'm sorry, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, uh, the Moon, and uh, Mars, uh, they have different pressures. You can read, read them. Uh, here's one bar. The Moon is very small, uh, very small pressure on, on, uh, on Mars as well. The Venus has a 50 bar pressure. It's very high pressure on Mars. On Venus, sorry. All right, if you can't read this, read your notes. It's all right. You don't have to know these numbers anyhow. All right, so that's what I'm saying. Uh, the Earth probably had a 40 bar pressure when it was young. 40 bar pressure. Okay. Uh, what are the effects of a, of a greenhouse uh, atmosphere? All right, well, first of all, it, makes, it uh, is like a blanket. It uh, makes the surface of the planet warmer. Uh, it scatters and absorbs radiation, makes the atmosphere blue as opposed to black. So, uh, and that's uh, scattering of optical light, okay? Um, creates pressure, allowing water to exist. Um, creates wind and weather, and this, of course, uh, promotes the erosion of the surface, so you uh, cannot see uh, impact craters for more than a few hundred years, or a thousand years. All right. All right, and it makes auroras, because it's the interaction of the solar wind with the atmosphere that makes the glowing uh, the glowing aurora. Okay, why is the sky blue? The sunsets are red. Uh, the skies are blue because sunlight coming down scatters uh, by something called Rayleigh scattering and it's primarily the blue light that gets scattered around and uh, we see it as it looks to us like the atmosphere is glowing. Whereas sunlight, sunset uh, there's so much scattering that uh, all the rays, including red to blue, is start, starting to scatter. And the blue is so scattered out that the only thing left is red light. And the sun looks reddish. OK, now, what would happen? Here's a question for you. Talk to your neighbor about this. If the, if the atmosphere were five times as dense as present, all right, imagine it to be five times its pressure. What color would the atmosphere be? Would it be red, blue, yellow, white? Daytime. Oh, yeah, daytime. All right, it's, you look at it like that, and uh, you say, what color is the atmosphere? All right, so talk to your neighbor. 
<clears throat> and see if, you, see if you can answer this. Is it going to be blue? All right, uh, let's, do, let's try this with the cards. Red. Okay, uh, blue. Uh, yellow. Nobody for yellow? White? All right, white is it. Why? Why is white right? Well, think of a cloud. What is a cloud? A cloud is white because all the light from all the light has been scattered. Everything scattered off a cloud, and the atmosphere is thick enough to scatter virtually everything. It won't be perfectly white, but it will be whitish. And everything gets scattered around, and uh, in that case, it's going to look whitish. You may not see the, the sun at all. Uh, it may be, all the light may be scattered out of it, but uh, what's left is going to be white. All right? Sc scattered light is white. Yes? If it were like two times red, then would it be red? Yes. Yes. Right. No, 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 no. That no. The red is because uh, all the, the light has been scattered away, scattered out in the space uh, in a sunset. Uh, had plenty of room to scatter the, the blue light out. Here, the blue light is still there, and uh, you're going to see a combination of blue and yellow. What color is that? Green. Green. Okay, Earth's atmosphere is going to be green. Okay, all right. Because the light that gets scattered uh, from the atmosphere, from the sun coming down, doesn't go away. It's still there. It's going to hit you eventually. Only it go it goes by way of collisions. Hits you eventually through the collisions. Okay. Uh, now. Let me show you a little bit how the greenhouse effect works. OK. So here is a planet that is uh, no atmosphere. So what is it doing? The sunlight is coming down, it's sort of yellowish, and the planet is radiating red light, uh, that's supposed to be infrared, but not, no matter. It's radiating infrared and it goes, uh, these are stars in the background, and uh, they get away. So the sun, the sun here is, uh, the temperature is given by the temperature of uh, the incident light on you. And so that's what you see. All right, now let's put an atmosphere on this planet. Okay, now, in this case, the atmosphere makes the, uh, the planet, makes, the atmos makes it blue, all right? And now, the light comes down, 
and it gets to the surface of the earth, heats the earth, but then the earth's light comes back and scatters. There it goes, that one scattered back. So that would mean that the temperature of the earth is going to be given by the incident radiation plus the heat, the radiation of, of the radiation coming back. So you have two sources of heat for the, for the earth. And this is how an atmosphere works. This is why blankets work. Yeah, you're wrapped up in a blanket, it absorbs the radiation you give, and it sends it back to you, and you're warmer. It's the same as a blanket. So that is a blanket for the Earth. Any questions on that? Very intuitive explanation of how a greenhouse gas works. So you can understand that if the, if the layer uh, is more and more scattering, then you'll have more often a uh, situation where it comes back. Uh, these have some probability of getting out to space, but a big probability they didn't never get very far. But if the blanket is warmer, uh, you'll be warmer. That's all it is. So if we block off uh, the, ultraviolet, the infrared radiation of uh, the photons emitted by the by the Earth, we make it possible for uh, a smaller fraction to escape and uh, keep us warm. This, has, this is very important to us because it has raised our temperature 43 degrees from a temperature you would naively calculate from the sunlight. Uh, 43? Yeah, 43 degrees. All right, this greenhouse effect really works and it's very important. Now, people don't, and the greenhouse effect that the people are talking about is not elimination or not of this greenhouse. Yes, we have a greenhouse and need it, but we don't need too thick a blanket. As we put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the blanket gets thicker and thicker. And we can only stand certain thickness uh, and too thick a blanket we don't want. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, visible, all right, again, visible light passes through the planet's atmosphere. Uh, some have absorbed. Uh, the planet irradiates the, the uh, light at in, as infrared light because it's not as hot as the sun. It's colder. So uh, the black body radiation means it'll, it'll emit in the infrared. Okay. Uh, but the infrared light is partially trapped by the atmosphere. Its return to space is slow, slowed down. Okay, so the overall temperature is higher than if there's no atmosphere at all. That's a, the important lesson to learn. Now, uh, what determines the planet's surface temperature? Uh, greenhouse effect will not change the incoming sunlight. We, don't, we can't change that. Uh, so it can't change the total energy return to space. Coming in, what comes in has to go out. That, that's the same equation. Uh, but it works like a blanket uh, and uh, keeps you warm inside. The energy, the heat is all in the lower atmosphere where we live. On the surface, it's warmer. But for the upper atmosphere, it's the same. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, and obviously, if there's no greenhouse effect, we've still got things that determine the, uh, the uh, temperature of the Earth. One thing we could do if we have a lot of greenhouse effect that uh, heats the Earth up is move away. 
we could put rockets somehow on the earth and uh, fire them up and push the earth away from wherever. That's kind of hard to do. So I don't think we're going to do that. Okay, you could uh, change the planet's reflectivity. Cover the planet in uh, aluminum foil. And then uh, that reflects everything, mostly. And uh, therefore, the planet uh, is colder when you reflect the light. Uh, this is called albedo. Uh, this is called albedo. And what that is, is uh, it's the measure of the light absorbed. Uh, albedo goes from zero, nothing's absorbed, to one, all, everything's absorbed. So the Earth has an albedo of, um, I don't know what the hell it is. What's the albedo of the Earth, anybody? Eric, do you know? Probably 0 0.5 or 0 0.4. 0 0.48? 0 0.4, okay. What is it? The albedo is mostly made by clouds. The clouds are white, they scatter the sunlight straight back into space, and uh, so it lowers the incident sunlight on the Earth. The tops of the clouds are white. Okay, uh, so the, the that cools the planet down. The clouds cool it down from that reason. Uh, okay, uh, the average temperature without the, the greenhouse effect, uh, as I said before, would be very cold. Okay, now how about for the distant planets, or the nearby planets? Uh, okay, the greenhouse effect uh, warms Venus, Earth, and Mars. Uh, it doesn't do anything to Mercury because there isn't any greenhouse, or this it doesn't do anything to the moon. Uh, Venus is strong, Earth is moderate, Mars is weak. All right, so uh, Venus and Earth would still be freezing without a greenhouse effect. Even Venus, which is closer into the sun, would be uh, freezing. Okay, so the greenhouse effect is very important for those reasons. Uh, okay, now here's a question for you. Talk to your neighbor about this. Uh, we said last time uh, that uh, the uh, carbon dioxide in the dolomite and the limestone uh, makes 40 atmospheres. What factor is this larger than our atmosphere? CO2, uh, their atmosphere, what, then our atmosphere? How much do we have to increase the carbon dioxide layer in order to get this, re this result? And so here are, your, here are four, four answers. So talk to your neighbor and let's see what, the, what you think. Everybody have the answer to this? They know this right away? <coughs> All right. How many people say uh, it's red? No, 40. Uh, 40, that's, that's the red card. All right. How many people say it's 1,000? The, the, the gold card? All right, how many people say it's uh, 40 divided by the abundance of carbon dioxide now, which is very small? And that's the green card. 10 to the 10th, that's, uh, what is that? That's the blue card. No. All right, the answer is uh, the green card. Because what I, I've been saying, this is the fraction of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's uh, 310 to the minus fourth. All right, so first of all, let's bring it up to one atmosphere, and then we need to have 40 times that, and the answer is 10 to the fifth times more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than at present. That's how much, that is how primitive 
the Earth's atmosphere was when it was born. Ten to the fifth times the abundance of CO2. All right? You know, you read these silly books of, about going back in past uh, to when the Earth was new, and you, you're going to change the life cycle of something or, something or, or other. Uh, you better take a gas mask so you can breathe. Okay? It's, uh, it was poisonous then. Okay, 10 to the fifth times uh, the, uh, the present abundance of carbon dioxide is buried in limestone dolomite and the ocean. Ocean has, I think, 50 to, or 100 times the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I mean, the atmospheric carbon dioxide is very important, but it's very small and is affected by a lot of other processes. All right? Okay, now, uh, I want to talk about thermal distribution. I said the particles are moving. They're moving fast uh, in an atmosphere, and that's what causes pressure. Now, an atmosphere is characterized by the following. And this is something uh, physicists didn't know until uh, the end of the 19th century. But it is the following. Kinetic energy equals kT. K is a constant. T is the temperature in degrees Kelvin. This is a result that they didn't know. All right. The kinetic energy of a gas molecule is one-half m V squared equals KT. So that means that V is equal to 2 KT over M. Uh, take the square root because this is V squared. All right? That is the speed. That's the average speed of a, part of a molecule or anything in the atmosphere. Now, what that means is that hydrogen, which has a low mass, is moving very fast compared to oxygen, which has a high mass, even if they're at the same temperature. So that's important to realize. Hydrogen and helium are moving fast, and uh, the uh, krypton and argon and carbon dioxide are moving slowly. If they're in the same temperature, that's just the way it works. Now, suppose we have, suppose a planet, uh, here's a planet, and it has an atmosphere, and up here at the top of the atmosphere, uh, you have to worry about how fast the molecules are moving because a molecule might be moving at escape speed. If it's moving at escape speed and it gets out, it doesn't hit anything else on the way out, it'll just fly away. It'll escape. Now, here is the peak distribution. The RMS is this value. And uh, it turns out that uh, the real distribution, uh, you have to take this as a three-dimensional distribution. And oh, it's all kinds of, it's too complicated to explain. But the, uh, the distribution of, of speed is uh, going to look like this. It's going to have a long tail. And if, this, if the tail exceeds the escape speed drawn here, for example, molecules or atoms that have a high enough velocity will escape. They're gone. All right, this is a uh, all right, distribution of, of uh, I don't know, sodium on the moon, uh, kilometers per second. So sodium is moving at a half kilometer per second. Uh, it has an escape speed right there. And some small fraction of the sodium atoms will go away. But now, the issue is, you say, OK, we lose those, so what? If you draw a similar curve for hydrogen, 
Uh, same idea. You lose the peak of it. You lose the end of it. So what? Doesn't matter. But what you have to realize is this distribution is an equilibrium distribution. And if, the, uh, if part of it's cut off, the, uh, the molecules collide with each other and uh, bounce around. And very soon, they, they show the same distribution that they had before. So the collisions among the atoms redistributes them and makes, uh, makes the fill up this distribution again, and then they go. All right, so that means that, uh, that, a, that a, you can calculate what the escape speed will be for anything. Now, hydrogen and helium are trapped on massive planets like Jupiter and Saturn, but they're not trapped on Earth-like planets. You, can, uh, you put in the equation, uh, if you put in this equation, and the mass is a certain thing, and, you, and for that thermal speed, it, uh, <coughs> it may or may not be enough to escape from the surface of the planet. Uh, the, uh, and so, in our atmosphere, hydrogen, all, all by itself, not hydrogen in combination with oxygen to form water, hydrogen will escape. Helium will escape. So they're not native. The hydrogen and helium uh, escape all the time. All right? So that means you, they're, not in our, they're not in our atmosphere. And we know that they're not in our atmosphere uh, for that reason. OK. So how do we gain and lose, uh, lose elements in the atmosphere? Uh, all right. The Jovian planets, the Jovian planets means anything that's a gas giant, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Jovian planets. Uh, the Jovian planets, uh, they're t the, the terrestrial planets, those like the Earth, were too small to hold on to the hydrogen and helium they were born with. So they just go away. All right? They, uh, uh, hydrogen and helium escape, uh, and the atmosphere uh, probably formed not when the planet was real hot and molten, but probably formed at an outgassing point a little later in its lifetime. So, uh, all right, now what are the sources of this atmosphere? Uh, I said, as I said, interior rock by volcanism releases uh, a lot of this stuff. Uh, Whatever is buried under Earth uh, releases it. Um, evaporation, surface liquids or ice, uh, we know how they will turn to, turn to uh, liquids and gases when they're heated. Um, bombardment, all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of things. This is how you lose atmosphere. If you get bombarded by stuff, you could heat the atmosphere up and just blast it out. It goes away. All right, now, how does, uh, here, how does uh, atmosphere interact with light? Uh, first of all, lasers, our x-rays, come in, and they have enough energy to, on, on any atom, that they will knock it in half or, or knock electrons out of the atom. Ultraviolet photons will break up molecules, and ultraviolet they make uh, oxygen. Uh, they make singly oxygen. Uh, this is now O. This is a free molecule, and this is OH. Uh, but they can make uh, ozone. Okay, uh, visible light photons uh, don't have enough energy to do anything. They just are scattered by uh, the blue light scatters off of visible light. That's all they do. And infrared photons don't even do that. But they do cause, uh, in molecules, uh, it can cause them to rotate, vibrate. These are transitions you learn about in chemistry. Anybody learn about this in chemistry? Learn about vibrational transitions, rotational. Anybody learn this? No? OK, you didn't take that advanced chemistry. Uh, if you take chemistry here, you'll, you'll learn about these transitions. Uh, so uh, 
The infrared photons come in and they're absorbed by molecules and causing them to rotate and vibrate. This is exactly, this is what the greenhouse gases do. They uh, take the incident radiation coming from the Earth and they make the molecule rotate and vibrate from, uh, from that. Okay. Uh, X-rays dissociate everything. Uh, ultraviolet dissociates some. Uh, it absorbs uh, uh, in ozone and water. Uh, oxy visible light passes through. Infrared light absorbs for greenhouses. So those are what the, those are the interactions of uh, the light with the atmosphere. And these interactions have uh, make the atmosphere's temperature do strange things. For example, uh, this is shown. It's shown here the height above the Earth in uh, what is that kilometers? Okay, and uh, this is kilometers above the Earth, and uh, this shows what happens. Now here's the temperature. Temperature on the surface of the Earth is uh, 17 degrees average. As you, climb the, as you climb up to 10 kilometers, the temperature goes down steadily. But then, if you go higher, the temperature doesn't go down steadily. It uh, climbs. And this is because the atmosphere in this region is heated by ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation heats the gas, and it has to be warmer and that causes this to do that. Then it goes back here, and it goes through another loop. Uh, this is, you know, this loop uh, is when the x-rays heat the gas uh, and ionize it. Uh, so, of course, you're not going to feel warm up there. You're going to be freezing. You go out, outside the spaceship, uh, you're dead anyhow. So you're not, uh, you know, no, the vacuum is, is a pretty good vacuum up there. But it does have a temperature. So these temperatures are characteristic, uh, and they're, they're caused because uh, the heating of the atmosphere by the sun. The sun doesn't really, it's not quite a black body that comes all the way down to the Earth, because first the x-rays are picked off, then the uh, ultraviolet is picked off, they're picked off by the, by the atmosphere interacting with the incident sunlight. All right, so uh, that's, that's an issue. Uh, uh, all the back and forth uh, temperature define the major atmospheric layers. Uh, this, is, uh, this layer uh, is known as the troposphere up to where it reverses. Then all this layer is known as the stratosphere. This layer is known as the thermosphere. And the exosphere, blah, blah, blah. All right, they're all known by different names. Not that it's important to know them. Uh, all right, so uh, thermosphere, exosphere. All right, so that's the issue. Those are the four layers of our atmosphere. but. We really exist in the troposphere, and don't worry about the rest of them. Okay, now, global wind patterns. I want to talk about the wind patterns on the Earth. Now, the Earth is heated by the sun. The sunlight, uh, the sunlight puts out most of the energy in the equator, and the equatorial zone should uh, heat up the gas will rise as it gets hot, and then it will flow north and south. It flows to the equators, which are colder. So the uh, flows of the atmosphere are going to be like this, north and south. All right, and as this shows it rising, and it's cooling over the, over the North Pole. Now, you have to combine that with the fact the Earth is rotating. And the rotation of the Earth gives rise to what's known as the Coriolis effect. And you've all seen the Coriolis effect. Uh, this is what happens if you're on a rotating table uh, and you uh, try to 
throw a ball toward the, uh, you're out here and you try to throw a ball toward the center and the earth is rotating, it appears that the ball is deflected to the right. All right? Now, have you ever tried this? You sat on, uh, what do they call it? Uh, what are these, the toy that's called? Hmm? Children's toy? Hmm? Uh, it's not a teeter tonner it's a... Merry-go-round's one, but how about the type that you just... Uh, I, at least I used to have one of these things. You just spin it yourself and jump on. What's that called? Huh? Anybody? You spin this thing and then jump on or off or what are you doing? No, not a swing. You know, you spin it around, a whole bunch of people put me on this thing. Maybe they're considered too dangerous anymore. All right. Anyhow, this used to be a children's toy. Uh, all right. But, and so you see this. It looked just like this. All right. So this is a demonstration of the Coriolis effect. Uh, here, uh, the Coriolis effect, ri the, heat, the rising air, cold air, uh, sinking and flowing back. It's a cycle. OK. Uh, and uh, that's basically, without the Coriolis effect, we'd have two atmospheric circulation cells. No problem. Now, uh, of course, air circulation is diverted by the Coriolis effect, uh, and it makes it like this. This is what the air circulation really does. Uh, it's heated from the equator. It flows up. But then the Coriolis effect causes it to veer to the right or left. This one flows up, and this one flows. You see this is reversed. And it flows one way, then it flows the other way, it flows the other way. This gives rise to the global weather pattern on the Earth. OK. Coriolis effect moves the wind either east to west or west to east. You would think, since we are moving to the east, we move this way, left to, on this curve like this. The wind, if it's stationary, should be uh, in our face going this way. So it should appear to be, you know, just stand. The at if, the, if the atmosphere isn't really stuck to the ground and the ground rotates around, you should feel a wind in your face if you're facing the west coast. And that is what you see. Now, that's not what we see. We see the opposite. Right? No. No, God. I'm sorry. We're. No, God. I'm sorry. I turned around. All right. Okay, sorry. Uh, the Earth is rotating this way, and that means you face the east and you've got a wind in your face. Okay? That is, a, that is the wind speed we see. Okay, now. Uh, Coriolis effect is weak on Mars and Venus because it's too small or rotates too slowly. Nothing's happening on them. Okay, and thick, uh, there's nothing happening on them at all. And the surface temperature is, is uh, uniform on Venus in spite of the fact it's heated on the equator because the air circulates a little bit. Okay, now... Uh, here, is, uh, here is a situation on the Earth. We have uh, strong winds from the east uh, because uh, this is where the Earth is going this way and the wind's sitting still. But then they reverse. They reverse here. They reverse here. And then it reverses again. Okay, so um, you ask the question, what, uh, that, this is more or less our weather, westerlies or easterlies. All right? And the long-term average of the weather at a given location is called the climate. All right, now, global wind patterns, uh, weather system west to east, mid-latitudes, northern hemisphere, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so, um, All right, now, 
One final question for you. If the Earth were spinning at twice its speed, what would effect would you have? All right, A, everybody gets flung off. B, Coriolis effect would increase and hurricanes would spin backward. Or C, we have more than three zones per hemisphere. All right? All right, I'll tell you, I'll just tell you, it's C. What does it look like? Uh, looks like this. Count the zones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, something like that. Twelve zones per hemisphere on Saturn. Okay, on, on Mars, on uh, Jupiter, a few less. This is all because they're rotating fast. A day on Saturn is 10 hours. That's all. And that rapid rotation makes a lot of zones. OK, I'll see you on uh, next Tuesday. And uh, hey, you should all start uh, the, the uh, lab exercise. It's easy. The weather's good, so get it with it.